Warren Young, welcome back to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's great to have you. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks for having me. No, thank you for it's coming great. on. I, I know it's the last thing, potentially, well, the last thing I do before Christmas. I know the last thing that you're doing before Christmas probably happened last week, so you, you're fitting me into the uh, the Christmas schedule, so I really do appreciate that. But anyone that doesn't know who you are, Warren, would you mind just giving us a little bit of a bio? Sure. Well, it goes back a long way, Rob, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll try and keep it... <laughs> Keep it brief. Um, so I started off um, doing an exercise sports science degree, like a lot of people, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and I even knew then that I wanted to coach. Um, so I went on and did a master's in Canada, and that was in the biomechanics of uh, jumping takeoff techniques. Um, and during that time, I was able to do some coaching with the university track team in jumps, which I absolutely loved. And that just uh, reinforced well, how much I loved applying, um, you know, the biomechanical principles to, to coaching. And anyway, when I came back to Melbourne, um, I was determined to get a job in track and field. Managed to get an interview um, at the Australian Institute of Sport for a jumps coach, but just missed out on it. Um, so a few months later, got a six-month contract at the University of Ballarat. So this is in the mid-80s now um, in sports science. And that turned into a full-time job, um, which was ongoing. And I ended up staying there for over 30 years. Okay. Uh, but in that time, I had a really valuable three-year stint at the AIS. So I took up a job um, as a sports scientist in strength training and testing and that was the first time that they offered such a job so it was a great opportunity to develop new test protocols because the state of the art then was pretty ordinary for testing athletes um, and while I was there for three years I managed to collect data for a PhD so the PhD was in um, strength and power assessment um, and then, for various reasons, came back to Ballarat. Um, and in 2017, so I've just cut through a lot of years here, <laughs> um, I started up a, uh, a new Masters in Strength and Conditioning, which we spoke about earlier together, um, and kind of got a bit burnt out from it, to be honest, um, and then sort of tr transitioned to retirement. And so now I'm actually retired from full-time uh, work, um, but just as an adjunct associate professor at Federation University. Um, so, you know, writing a few articles, collaborating with people like Scott Talpy, uh, who you know, and um, just finishing off with a, a PhD student as well. Are we That's actually pretty much it. Yeah. So what does adjunct actually mean? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it means uh, sort of supplementary, like unessential. Uh, but but really, it's just a voluntary role for um, for people that yeah usually have have retired, um, and that way you you keep engaged, I suppose, with people. You can collaborate and do, I guess, do the things that you want to do rather than all the crap that you you hate about the job. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So well, so I'm interested, and this is probably a good another personal line, but the the been burnt out from the masters. Talk to us a little bit about that. What 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 led to that? Uh, I I'm, think only, was... I'm only asking Warren because it's such a it's such a I suppose on trend topic to talk, which is great to talk about this kind of thing now. Probably more in the practitioner side of things, but hundred percent applies to the academic side of things as well. Yeah, I think it was just not a, um, the university is. It's a great university, but doesn't have the wealth of some of the bigger ones, so didn't have the resources to support in terms of other staff and um, the workload just, just got just got on top of me. Um, and because everything was so new, I mean, the process of getting the Masters approved was, you know, so bureaucratic. It's a thing I didn't like about the job. Um, so going through all those hurdles, yeah, it just, it just sort of became a bit overwhelming. So I just decided to... To, to back off um, and Scott Talpy is is taken over that role so it's it's in good hands excellent excellent thanks for that um 
so you've become very very much well known for your work in the agility space and it's something that obviously comes up in the podcast with various different practitioners from researchers to to um uh, applied applied coaches so with that in mind i'd love to get a little bit of a history because as you mentioned 30 years um at, at Ballarat or at uh, Federation as it is now would you be able to give us that little bit of a history on your involvement with agility um and the, because every time someone discusses agility that framework I can't remember what it was like 2014 maybe the uh fr- you mean the model that's yes the model one? yes I think that, that actually came out in 2002 oh wow one. okay right yeah. okay so it's probably been adjusted, uh, but, and I'm thinking of 2014. Okay, yeah, yeah 2000. You close 2015. It was it was adjusted, and I think that's an important change, which we probably should talk about. Um, but um, yeah, I just found after doing a lot of research in that sort of strength and power area that um, yeah, kind of had enough of that um, and wanted to do something new. And there was a there just seemed a huge gap and a lack of work in in the agility space so i just made the decision to 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 dive into that and it yeah probably started around that time so that model um which showed originally that agility was um considered as either um change of direction speed which was meant to represent the movement and then a cognitive component which is the decision making and then there's a whole lot of other factors under that that uh, that ultimately influence agility performance as well. So, yeah, that's probably where it started. So, as a field, from a very generalised perspective, what do you think's changed in our thinking on this topic since then? Well, the first, the most obvious thing I think is the the language um, with change of direction ability being commonly, widely used now when people are talking about a pre-planned movement that doesn't involve a cognitive component or a decision uh, to a to a stimulus. Um, so, yeah, keeping the change of direction ability kind of separate from agility is probably the, the, big, the big thing. Okay, so that's something that's come about since you've done that work in 2002? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think I think that has um, sort of fostered that thinking a bit. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that and, a, and yeah, go on. No, I'm going to say is that something that's a positive thing for this whole rounded area of agility, or is that yeah. causing a few problems? Yeah, that's it's a good question because I think what it has done is it has created that separation of um, factors uh, or components. Um, and people see the change of direction ability as a, a, a key component of agility from that model. And then they say, well, if it underpins agility, that's the thing I'm going to focus on. And then they ignore the other component completely. Um, so that, that can can be an issue. So is that is that fostered from academics or is that is the work being done and then misrepresented and Mis, not really mis- misrepresented, but misunderstood in the field, and there's that disconnect between the two, or is the problem right at the start? I think it probably starts with academics that are publishing stuff, and then they, they'll they they'll say, well, change of direction ability is a component of agility, so that's what I'm going to go into, and then they'll go just focus totally on that. Okay, so so academics need to do a better job of of including the whole model versus just sticking to one side and then inferring that it helps the model? Yeah, I think so. So uh, it's a good opportunity to jump to the revised model, Yeah. so the 2015 one. So I I prefer not to call it change of direction ability now um, in the model. And the, the three key components are uh, the physical, the technical or technique, and the cognitive, which includes the perception and decision making. Um, so I think when people talk about change of direction, um, often they are actually referring to technique. Okay. So 
people are focusing on the on the technique side. So does the physical and the cognitive get missed? And again, is that an issue for the practitioner, or does that actually start from the academic side? Yeah, look, I'm not sure where where it starts and uh, how that has happened, but I think it's it's partly because. Um, it's much easier for people scientifically minded to break things down and to, um, in a, a laboratory setting where everything's controlled, to um, to be able to test change of direction ability. Uh, it's so much harder to test agility with that decision-making element in it. Um, so I think for convenience, perhaps, um, that's one of the reasons why people have um, just focused on change of direction. So do you think in academia there is there is work being done in them harder aspects to try to quantify when it comes to change direction ability or however you want to term it? Or do you think it's we're down this technical road because of the constraints that we have in laboratories and convenience, like you say? Yeah, I think I think um change of direction ability is easy to, to assess and it's usually it's usually just the time taken to go around a pre planned uh, course, as you know, people would know with 505, the Pro Agility, the Illinois test, there's so many examples. Um, but uh, certainly I've been involved in trying to develop agility tests that have that decision-making component and, and we, we could spend hours going through all that. So I don't know how much you want to go into that. Yeah, so I'd be really interested to know from that from that work, to in, including that cognitive side of things into agility tests, what has translated from your experience and speaking to people, what has translated best into an applied world that's been, yeah, the integration of that, of a specific test into coaches world day to day or week to week on the testing front? Yeah. Well, as you said, um, before we started, Rob, just when we were chatting, um, a lot of coaches at high performance um, are actually not testing. In fact, I had a, had a PhD student, Russ Rayner, who uh, did his agility PhD in Australian rules football, and he surveyed all the high performance managers and asked them about their uh, beliefs and practices in in agility testing, uh, amongst other things. And pretty much universally, they didn't do a particular test. Um, so a lot of them relied on subjective evaluation. So what? Um, so the tests. I oh, sorry. I was going to say the tests that have been designed for holistic agility with decision making. That, for example, I've been involved in have been done with a research question in mind. They haven't really been designed specifically for practitioners to use in the field, which um, makes them yeah pretty inconvenient and also time consuming. You know, labor intensive, equipment intensive, and and I think that's one of the reasons that that uh, that practitioners um, haven't done those sort of tests. Okay, so do you think that is the next frontier for this area to be able to have a, a test that can be integrated into the high performance setting? Is that uh, doable? Yeah, look, it's it's a, it's a huge ask because agility by its nature is so um, open and variable and um, as a result it's not something you can just easily measure in a lab like you can with other qualities um, so yeah it's going to be an ongoing challenge I think uh, to do that but yeah there's been a, f a few attempts to do it um, but I think the starting point has to be to use subjective evaluation and, and try to understand how how athletes move um, before worrying about investing all that time and energy in, into testing. So when did Russ do that questionnaire as part of the PhD? Um, a few years ago. Okay. Yeah. So if we'd have gone back 10 years, maybe 15 years, would that have changed and would more of more coaches have been doing change direction or agility tests and have since moved away? Uh, probably. So... <clears throat> In Australian rules football, which I have most sort of experience in, the the, the AFL have a, a test they use for talent ID, 
um, called that planned AFL agility test, uh, which is um, well, we could <laughs> talk forever about that. Not happy about but, that. <laughs> uh, um, it's pretty random. It's it's just um, weaving around five poles, and it's the quickest time. But they do it um, in a combine situation every year, and they re- they use that amongst a whole lot of other things to to recruit athletes into professional teams. So, um, but I've I think even and that's been going for for decades. But I I think that um, a, a not a lot of faith has been placed in that test for from actual clubs and and coaches. I think uh, you know they look at it with some interest just to get a crude. Um, idea of how an athlete moves but yeah they don't hang too much importance on it okay so when people say subjective evaluation is that just watching video and evaluating in the mind of the coach to say okay i've saw like almost um unstructured subjective evaluation are we talking about structured subjective evaluations yeah, I, I am not aware of um, extensive checklists or anything like that that people can use for a structured evaluation. Um, you know, there are known factors that contribute to good technique and um, injury risky technique that people can probably use. But I don't think anyone's really sat down and presented that um, as something that coaches can use, probably something that does need to be done. So when it comes to, I suppose, uh, testing change direction ability as a whole, the testing options that we've got, because we all went through them when we did our undergrad sports science degrees, what is the innate problems with those kind of tests? And and are they the reasons why people seem to have moved away from... Because it's a common theme in guests that come on the podcast of moving away from those type of tests. Well, in my opinion, I don't think they... Are relevant to agility performance in sports like invasion sports because they are just how fast you can move in a pre-planned um, pattern and they don't even represent the technical demands of the sport very well and they certainly totally ignore the cognitive component. So I think they uh, often lack uh, relevance at all to agility as it is needed on field so perhaps we should distinguish between change of direction ability and agility can we do that of course go yeah so uh, a classic example of a change of direction um, sport or, or a component of the sport would be running between wickets in cricket so the the batsman um, runs down the end targets the the line that they have to cross with their foot or their bat and then they do a 180 degree turn and run back the other way. And the speed that they can change direction will influence how many runs they can get. So that is uh, pre-planned. The, um, the player knows how fast they're going to be approaching. They know what technique they can use. Um, and there's no reaction to any kind of stimulus. Um, so um, change of direction tests for change of direction sports are totally valuable um, and the 505 test in fact was originally developed with running between rick- wickets in cricket in mind and i think it's quite good for that um, but in invasion sports agility is very different um, because of the, the the need to react to a, a stimulus so i should go into that yes absolutely i'm just writing okay, notes so, keep going <laughs> yeah. so the, i guess the the thing that's um influenced me the most in my thinking in recent years is just trying to um, explain uh, what agility is in the context of a sport, such as an invasion sport like all codes of football. Um, And we talk about a general definition of reacting to a stimulus, movement, uh, that's one way to think of it, but that's very simplistic. Um, In in a sport such as, let's take, take soccer, um, uh, there are many scenarios where there might be a stimulus the player has to react to and change direction. So it might be a missed kick or something like that. But in my opinion, um, the most impactful 
situations in the sport where an athlete needs good agility is in a contest when the ball's in dispute. So you can imagine the player dribbling the ball and defenders are coming towards the player and the player uh, is under pressure, so they need to do something. So they, they might stop hard, decelerate, or they might do some sort of lateral movement in reaction to the defender's actions. They might even uh, throw in a deceptive action like a, a, a fake pass or a, a fake step. Um, and the purpose for that is to give themselves time and space in order to either pass the ball to a teammate or to progress further down the field. Um, and for the defender, it's kind of the opposite of that. The defender is trying to dispossess the attacker um, and get close enough in, in proximity so it's to reduce that space and time to ultimately get a, achieve a turnover. Um, and if the sport allows tackling, it might, might involve a tackle. But it's that movement to, 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 to do that. And both the attacker and defender are reacting to each other instantly. You know, as they get closer, the, the attacker might uh, move one way, reads the, the way the defender's responding to that, and then might you know, go the other way, or they might continue in the same direction. But there's, there's a constant evaluation um, to, to make that final change of direction or, or, or speed that's required. So I think that's really important that we, that we understand it that way. And so it kind of makes sense that, you know, these change of direction tests that are traditionally being done really lack a lot of relevance to that. With that description, it probably doesn't highlight it as much. But in my mind, as you describe it, I'm going the, that first, maybe not in the contest example, but certainly in, a, I suppose, a gameplay example, the attacker is initiating that first movement, potentially, but the defender is reacting initially to that first movement of the attacker. So that would suggest that we need to train defenders differently to attackers. Is that right? Exactly. You... It's okay. a good uh, uh, point for me to, to say that, yeah, we've done some research in that. And uh, like, so we have done a test that's tried to assess both attacking and defending agility separately. And that's also been sort of uh, duplicated in rugby. This is for Australian football, but that was duplicated in rugby union and showed that um, the correlation between attacking and defending agility is not that high. Uh, so what that means is being good at one doesn't, doesn't guarantee being good at the other. So yeah, they are somewhat different skills and that's partly because of movements uh, uh, can be different. Um, so for example, a defender when they approach an attacker and they're kind of waiting for what they need to do, they will maybe shuffle um, and and to get into a position to block and then and then maybe cut. Whereas an attacker might do a straight out hard sidestep. You know, so the techniques can be different. Um, and also the the view, so the, the perception of, of how, and the decision making is different as well uh, because the attacker, like in a rugby player, that might be carrying a ball. Uh, so you're looking at different cues um, to what the defenders, or the defender and the attacker are looking at different, you know, uh, uh, parts of the body. Um, so yeah, all those sorts of things influence um, the, the difference between the two. So yeah, ideally they should be trained and tested with that in mind. So that's from a <clears throat> excuse me. That's from a testing point of view. From a training point of view, what kind of things would you put in place to tweak the attacker versus the defender, or the defender versus the attacker, and the differences between the two? Yeah, I know you've mentioned a few there. Yeah, well, um, I mean, the test that I was referring to that um, produced that research and came up with those conclusions was a one v one contest, and that test could easily be turned into a training session. So I'll try and explain it. It's a, If you can imagine a, a square little pitch, maybe 12 by 12 metres, something like that, and the attacker, depending on the sport, has possession of the ball and has to try to evade the defender and get to the, the end line to, to win and score. 
um, and the defender's job is to try to shadow and prevent them from doing that. Um, so uh, I won't go into the test unless you want me to, but from a training perspective, um, what you would do is you would have uh, players start in different positions in that square. Um, so, you know, some to the side, some purely front on, some start close together, some further apart. So what you're trying to do is vary the speed at which they come together and also the view that they have of each other. So, you, yeah, you're really trying to represent different agility scenarios in games. Um, and if you want, you can make it a uh, have tackling involved, but if not, it could be just a tag um, that the defender tries to do. So how would that work in the test? Explain the test to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the tricky thing in the test is, so you'd have, let's say you've got, you're assessing attacking first. So the defender has to be someone who is the tester. And it's, it's hard to, to find the right person to do that. But it has to be someone of a similar standard. So it could be a, another player in the team, but um, it could be an assistant coach or someone like that. But, um, but that tester has to be able to act as a defender to all the players on the team in order to be able to compare them. Um, so that's why it's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite hard to do logistically. Um, but then, so let's, let's say you can do that, then um, the roles are reversed and the, um, the player being assessed becomes the defender and they're trying to um, tag or shadow the tester who's who has the role of the attacker so yeah so the players assume the role of attacker and defender in different trials and you do a number of trials and you the the um, scoring it's hard to explain but um, it's based on the proximity of the players to each other so the attacker is trying to get around the defender without being touched okay so they we're assuming their agility um, is good if they can totally evade without being touched. Um, so if they get past without being touched, they get the maximum points, which is, in our example, it was three. Um, if the defender reaches out, and this is for Australian rules where you can grab them, touches them with one outstretched hand, that means the defender's got closer, so they only get two points. If the defender gets two hands on them, it's one point, and if the defender misses, it's, um, it's, it's zero. Uh, and then the scoring is reversed um, for the other the other way. So the defender gets maximum points for a two-handed tag and zero for, for being evaded completely. So if you do 10 trials, you get a total maximum score of 30. And, and that's, what, that's what we've done as a test. And it's been, you know, it's reliable. Um, and it's, as I said, it's been adapted for, for rugby. So I think... You know, it's promising if you can get around the logistics of it. Yeah. So for something like soccer, so something like football, how would that differ? Because obviously we're not touching, but we're tackling with legs and whatnot. How would that work? Would yeah, that work? That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I've talked to um, uh, an academy, a soccer academy SNC coach who was trying to do that, and I haven't really... Uh, heard how he how he went with it, but and also I've talked to Rich Clark yes. um, about about the same thing, and and he he agreed that um, yeah more work needs to be done to make that work for soccer. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So would that involve any subjective evaluation or not in that win that test? Well, with that test, what you, you can score pretty reliably live. So if someone's uh, watching it. Uh, in real time, they can pretty accurately pick the two-handed tag, one-handed tag, and so on. But it would be it's more effective to use video footage to confirm their scoring. So once you've captured that video footage, you can then look at it after, and you can do the subjective um, evaluation as well. So that's what I'd recommend. Nice. Okay, so when it comes to the coaching side of things, so strategies to enhance agility. I know we've we've kind of touched on a few and it was something that I picked out um, a, a little a bit of text that I picked out of the high performance training for sports um, agility chapter so physical capacity to perform to uh, transfer of training to 
uh, change direction, situational, change direction, and then worst case, sorry, worst case scenario. So I'm just interested how we would take the work that's been done in the research and translate that into what happens on a day-to-day basis in a soccer club, AFL club, rugby club. So I'm just interested to get your thoughts on how we go about doing that from potential uh, drill progression, where we'd start, whether it be a... Cl- <laughs> whether oh, no, it be- I think it's quite a massive question, that is. <laughs> whether it be closed, closed drills, open drills, yeah. yeah. We've got to the hour, Warren, and I said I'd keep you to the hour, so... <laughs> We haven't gone too long, but it'd be good to to get a a bit of an overview from you if possible. Yeah, okay. So the starting point is that even though an S&C coach um, is usually responsible for the physical component and focuses on that, I believe that they can be more impactful and effective on the athlete's performance if they also address the the technical and the cognitive. So that's, I think, an important starting point. So does what, what activities can we do to address all of those across a period of time, I think is is what we we start with. So with the technical, I think this is where it's a bit controversial because um, that's where people will just do um, pre-planned change of direction type activities. Now, I, I definitely do see a role for it, okay? So people have probably heard me say that it's not so relevant, but um, by doing... Um, multiple reps of, say, sidestepping, um, where the coach can control the loading on the on the leg, the push off leg, um, by controlling the speed of approach and the angle of cut, because those things affect the loading. Um, I I fully get that you can improve the physical capacity to do that better. Um, so that's one one strategy right there that that I would accept. Um, and I also think there's probably a place for some of that isolated um, technical work um, to work on a safe sidestepping technique. So what I mean by that is um, ACL injuries um, occur in invasion sports uh, a fair bit, and it's the in non non contact injuries. It's often the the sidestep or the cut where where that occurs. Um, so Tom Dos Santos has done a lot of great work in that area and there's a whole list of technical points that he's shown you can improve um, with the right cues. So I think there's, there is a place for that, uh, for sure. Um, I see a place for deceleration work because sometimes agility itself, even in a game, is not even lateral change of direction. He's just, just stopping hard to create that space from a an opponent um, so deceleration work in, in works on the on the physical capacity and then of course there's a whole range of things that can be done in the gym in the weight room and plyometrics is a, is a key I think so when you look at sidestepping and you look at the demands of it in terms of the stretch shortening cycle the ground contact time and all of that the stiffness that the leg requires um, it just lends itself to plyometric training um, so there's a whole range of exercises that you know, you can progress from bilateral vertical like drop jumping um, to, to to more specific um, jumps with, uh, you know, lateral components off a, off a single leg. Um, but for the technical, I think that, and something I've talked about before, um, although I'm no skill acquisition expert, the concept of perception action coupling, I think, comes into play so it's believed that if you take the 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 perception is the decision making and the stimulus the action is the movement if you separate the movement and just do isolated change of direction drills then you take the movement out of context of the game because perception and action influence each other Um, and we know that if you um, look at someone's technique when they're doing a pre-planned cut and then you introduce a stimulus, whether it's a generic stimulus or a, an opponent, their technique will change uh, significantly. So it doesn't make sense to um, to keep that separate for training the technical aspect. 
So I totally get that it's okay for the physical capacities, but when it comes to getting maximum transfer from technique work, I think it's important to try to keep that um, perception action intact and to include the decision-making element, usually from um, an opponent because that's sport-specific. So how do you do that? Well, it comes back to that um, 1v1 example. Yeah. So you can start off with um, jogging speeds as players approach each other. You can have rules and constraints around that to prevent it from being too complex and intense. Um, and then you can, and you can take away uh, deceptive actions. Um, and then you, you could in, you could gradually introduce those those elements uh, to to increase the complexity and the um, and the intensity. So I guess what I'm saying is I think there's a role for that kind of activity across a whole range of performance levels. I suppose the million dollar question is at what point are we, and I know there's not one cutoff point, it's all kind of on a, a spectrum of, of intermingling the two, but transferring from the more pre-planned work to the more chaotic work. And you've given an example there of, of actually constraining the chaotic work to make that transition a little bit a little bit smoother but what so i'm just thinking of kind of novice youth athletes would you focus more down the pre-planned end and start slowly introducing the more chaotic or would that be introduced right from the start and just putting in constraints like you say yeah that's a, that's a great question um and I, I you know my thinking on that's just evolving all the time too so um I mean, yeah, I, I think the constraints work for youth athletes, you know, so there's no danger in them doing it uh, from from the beginning. But I think the best uh, strategy really is to look at the athlete as an individual. So regardless of their age, um, you know, there are some youth athletes that are incredibly strong and great movers, you know, um, so why spend a, a ridiculous amount of time on on basics and pre-planned actions just like you don't spend all your time on basic strength development if they've already got a really good strength base? You, you move on from that. So if it can be individualized, that's the ideal. Do you think we stick down the pre-planned end too long because it's it's safe in our mind because it's structured and it's we can put a we can put a time on it, or we can we can um, just keep it confined to a, a specific area. It doesn't look messy, looks cool on Instagram or whatever it might be. Do you think we stick down there too long before introducing the more chaotic stuff? Yeah, I do, I do, and I and for the reasons that you mentioned exactly, it's so much easier to plan and control, and that's what S and C coaches want to do. But you, as you also said, there's that point where you you've got to get the balance right and that's that's a that's a hard one yeah i spoke to john goodwin don't know if you've come across john who works in the uk sprint guy was at fulham academy but he's moving to back to saudi arabia i believe he was at st mary's for a long time and he coined a term i think he coined the term uh, co coaching ugly and being happy in that chaotic environment when it's just on the edge of being ugly and being happy being there versus um, uh, re regressing it so much that it looks perfect, looks great on YouTube, looks great on Instagram, whatever it may be, but you're not actually progressing the players because we're not at that edge of ugly yet. We're not at the edge of putting these athletes in a situation where they're actually learning and developing. Would that be something that you, I suppose, backs up what we just said about being the pre-planned too long? Yeah, exactly. Like philosophically, uh, I would agree with that completely. And particularly in sports like um, soccer, where it is chaotic, and you've you've got to you've got to be able to prepare for that demand. Yeah. So, so when it comes to the programming and it, in, including whether it be change of action ability or agility into our week, into our month, into our year, where does it fit in? Is it something that can be 
put into, especially the pre-planned stuff, is that something that is in the warm-up and then it transitions into a small-sided game where we can introduce those 1v1s? Is it right at the start of the week when it's furthest away from the game? What would you recommend there just for people trying to trying to plan this uh, in, in a week or a month? Yeah. Uh, look, it's hard to answer the when in the week because it depends on what time of the season we're talking about. But... Um, but um, yeah, what, what, I forgot the first thing you said. Yeah, I, no, no uh, it's just, um, just I suppose where in the is it something we can we can include in the warm up? I'm guessing yes, these one these one v one situations could be quite a nice place to start if we're going into larger um, small sided games. So maybe that one v one would fit really well in the warm up, especially with youth players. Yeah, and well, especially the and the pre-planned stuff. Yeah, definitely can can be as well. You know, the the and the deceleration drills. Some of that can be done there. So yeah, that that, that makes that makes sense. And then we haven't talked about small-sided games because yeah. they're they're good for agility as well because you know they don't cater for the physical development so much, but the um, the technical and the cognitive they are very good. Um, and so when you say where do they fit into the program, well, because small-sided games by their nature, you know, also have a tactical component and they involve other skills besides just evasion and agility, you know, there's passing and whatever, then by talking with skills coaches, the other coaches, then you come up with some sort of integrated approach that targets, like, so you might do a small-sided game with a focus on kicking or something, or uh, handballing in Australian football, um, but then switch the focus, you know, within the game by changing some constraints to to agility. So yeah, I think it can be integrated that way. And obviously, we're going to be developing and focus on different things, whether it's a, a smaller, small sided game, or a larger, small sided game, tighter areas, bigger areas, more players, less players. All them things can be manipulated to get the outcome that we want. Exactly, yeah. So if you have um, high density, so uh, a lot of players in a small space, then you're going to get more evasive action um, so long as players don't just keep passing and, and don't attempt to evade. And so that's something that you can manipulate with the rules to ensure that they don't just pass. So you encourage evasion. Um but in doing that in a small space, then movement speeds won't be very high. So you won't, you know, it's a safer activity. It won't, um, yeah, it may not pr- produce the overload you want, but it might uh, physically, but it might have the, the cognitive because there might be more um, agility scenarios per minute type of, in that situation. But if it's a bigger pitch, less dense, then you're going to have faster movement speeds and yeah, it's obviously going to change the training stimulus. So yeah, coaches should try to manipulate those constraints to achieve what they want. One last thing before I let you go, Warren, I can't let it go because <clears throat> you've mentioned it a few times. Deceleration and specifically de- deceleration training. Is there anything that you would recommend when we're isolating that portion of agility that coaches could take away and work on? Uh, not... Really, I think there's you know there's te- technical points and cues that you can use. Um, you know, I know Damien Harper's done some great work in that area, um, and and Tom Dos Santos as well. And you know, the talk about slamming on the brakes early rather than trying to stop on the one last step, which will load the knee up and be risky and so on. So yeah, that that sort of thing. Uh, you know, lowering the body. Uh, shortening the steps, um, starting to lean back. Yeah, there's various cues, I suppose, that that you can use. But I I haven't done a lot of that sort of myself. Okay, cool. So for anyone out there who wants to dive into some of the work that you've done, whether it be current or, or, or previous, where's the best place for people to go? And second question, where's the best place for people to contact you on social media? Mm. So I'm not very good at keeping uh, up with things like ResearchGate, and so I can't I can't think of a 
a, a, a particular f forum where people can just tap into the like articles and so on. But you know, use Google Scholar and you'll probably find them. Um, but in terms of discussion with me, um, I don't do too much on on social media. I'd rather talk to people with extended conversations. I mean, I've got the time to do that now. And I'm really, <laughs> really happy to to have email conversations with people. So That's great. Feel free to share the email address. Yeah, perfect. Love that. Take it off social media and have some real conversation. How wild is that concept? <laughs> <laughs> Old school, but good. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, Warren, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate you uh, giving it me time during your Christmas break and uh, look forward to catching up soon. No worries. Thanks, Rob, and have a good Christmas yourself. Thanks, mate.